Well, today is a new day, a new day in the Lord. I'm excited to be here. I'm sorry there aren't more people, but really, I don't have to fear now a crowd. <laughs> so I'd like to start off uh, with a little funny story, get everybody in a good mood. Uh, do we have any golfers here? Yeah. Do we have any golfers? We do have one golfer anymore? Two, three? Well, maybe the story won't go over too well. Anyway, one day, Jesus and Moses were out playing golf together. And Moses started off, they were on one of these water holes where you have to hit the ball over the water to get to the green. There's no fairway. And so Moses takes his club and he takes a big swing at the ball, but he barely clips it and it pops over and it drops into the water. But then all of a sudden, the water opens up. And the ball continues down through this alleyway up onto the green. And Jesus looks at Moses and says, wow, Moses, that was a good shot. You made the water part. Well, now it's Jesus' turn. He gets up. He's younger and he's stronger. He takes it and hits the ball. The, his ball goes up through the air and just almost makes it to the green but plops in the water right, right before the green. And then all of a sudden, though, the ball starts to bounce on top of the water, and it goes along on the water and ends up on the green. And Moses looks at Jesus and says, boy, that was a pretty good shot. Your ball walked on the water. Well, now there's this real old man with this long beard and this long hair who's hunched over, and he gets up, and it's his turn. He's playing with them. And he takes a swing at the ball and just kaplunk. Doesn't go very far. Drops into the water where there's a lily pad. And there's a frog sitting on this lily pad. And the ball ends up going into the frog's mouth. And then all of a sudden, soaring from above out of the sky is an eagle who comes down and swoops down over this frog and picks him up and carries him up over the green drops him on the green, the ball pops out of the frog's mouth and goes right into the cup. And it's a hole in one. And Moses looks at Jesus and says, you know what? I really don't like playing with your father. <laughs> so, the message today is kind of about anger and loss. We're a family here, and we all take losses, and losses make us angry. I remember when I was in high school, and it came over the radio that JFK was assassinated. And as a young man, that made me angry. And as I got older, I realized that anger is equated with pain. When we're in pain, we get angry. When I get sick with the flu, I'm, I, don't, I don't want anybody around me. I'm, I'm annoyed. I'm very short with my wife who wants to make me feel better. I, I, don't, I don't want anybody around. So I've learned over life that we go through these moments of anger, just like the Lord. The Lord got angry a few times, as we know. He got angry at Sodom and Gomorrah. He got angry and, you know, flooded the earth. He... We have an angry God. He gets angry. And I think today he's even more angry than ever because we have billions of people on this planet that are lost. And they're lost either in their anger or their pain or some reason. And it's the loss of all those souls that angers our Lord. He doesn't want to lose anybody. And yet, because we go through these trials in life, because we go through trials and we go through pain and we have anger built up in us, we end up missing 
a lot of what the Lord really did have to offer. Now, Yeshua, he had a little temper too. He showed it in the temple when he turned over tables. He showed it when he walked by the fig tree that had no fruit, and he cursed that fig tree. And what happened the next time he walked by that fig tree? It was gone. It was dead. So to deal with anger and to deal with loss, God gave us a tool. He gave us a tongue. And the power of the Lord is in our tongue. And we can either use it to defeat pain, anger, all the things that come against us, or we can use it to curse. We can use it to curse things. But that wasn't what it was designed for. If you go, if you go back to the beginning in 1 John, uh, where it says the word was the Lord, the Lord was with us. It is predated, John, by the fact that in Genesis, the Lord said with his tongue one day, let there be light. He spoke it into existence. And, it, and speaking it into existence is what we're supposed to do when we're in a situation where we're angry, where we're in pain, where we're, things just aren't going right. We have the ability to change those circumstances with the power of the Lord in our life. It's, uh, it's interesting to me that, that the world that we live in was a fallen world. It was God's anger against Lucifer that by design he cast him from heaven onto a dark world, a fallen world, a world of no light. It was nothing but swamps or God knows what, but this was a terrible place to live. And then one day, because of his creation, God was lonely and God said, you know, I'm going to, there's not only is there going to be light, but I'm going to create something human in my image, a man. I'm going to create, I'm going to take my creation to another level. What he did was magnificent, but he impregnated in all of us the exact same DNA of Yeshua. So if Yeshua got mad in the temple over what he disliked or what he considered evil, then we get mad. It's, it's automatic. It's part of us. So every time I get mad, and I get mad for stupid things, and I'm sure we all do, but every time I get mad, I have to stop myself. And I have to say, this is a time to act like the Lord. This is a time to use my tongue and my brain to create a better circumstance, to change it, not to be caught up, not to be knocked down, but we have the ability in life to do whatever it is that we want to do. God created us for that. He created us, and look what we've created. The problem is we have a world now that's divided. We have an angry world. We have an angry country. Half the people in this country are mad that, that Donald Trump is president. The other half of the country is glad and, and enjoying it. So it's this division of mankind that continues, I believe, to pull on the heartstrings of heaven. That there's a book of life up there. We're all in it. We're all saved. At least I hope we are. Is there anybody here that isn't saved? <laughs> Okay, we're all good. Uh, but the, the truth of the matter is, we are really have a life and an existence that is so special. Look, everybody here knows I had had a federally funded vacation. It, I had a ball. I mean, it was, it, was, it, it was just terrific. The first 10 months, I was basically locked up in solitude. And I had me, the Bible a sink, a toilet, and a bed in this room. And I thought, Lord, should I be angry? <laughs> should I be annoyed with this? Should I, should I let this take me down, finish me off? God said, no, you're going to use this. You're going to use this moment to change lives, change your life, change the perception that people have of this place. Well, the first 
guard that I engaged in this exciting journey of mine was a little Japanese woman and I asked her a question and her answer to me is, I don't want to see your face. <laughs> I, th I thought, what? <laughs> yes. I just asked her a simple question and I don't want to see your face. So I thought, well, glad we won that war. <clears throat> so, so I'm confronted, I'm in this situation. Now, one of the first people I meet is a black guy and his name is Doughboy because he weighs over 400 pounds. So he looks like the Pillsbury Doughboy. And he calls me Papa Merv and he's a young man and a wonderful man and I'm trying to help him along. And sure enough, while he's there incarcerated, Doughboy's mother passes away. And then there was another guy there. His nickname was Tutu. He was the ringleader of this group called the Broadway Gang in downtown LA. And one day, the feds arrested 78 people that were at a picnic for this supposed Broadway Gang. So if you went to the picnic that Sunday, you got indicted for going to a picnic because they scooped up this whole gang. Well, th these were all black guys and, and I became friendly with most of them and, and one after another was divorced, the mother died, everything else. And, and these people really had no hope. And when I saw that, I thought, you know, Merv, there's gotta be something you can do here because they're angry, they're in pain, and they don't have any hope. And they're, they're, these souls that are so precious to the Lord are going to be lost. They're, they're, they're going to come out of prison worse off than when they came in. And so what can I do? How can I help? What, what is there that I can do? And so it took a, a long time for me to come around from that first 10 months of solitude to the point where I was going to bring a letter today that I wrote Loretta after the 10th month and read it to you to kind of give you a better idea of what was really going on in my mind and our lives and everything, but I forgot it, so, which is normal. Uh, I forgot what I had for breakfast. And so anyway, but in that letter, I discussed with her the pain, the anger of what was going on, and then the loss. We lost a home. We lost so many things as a result of this event that took place in my life. How many of you have lost something that was near and dear to your heart? Everybody. We all, we all lose things. And yet, we've learned through God's word, who was here in the beginning, we learn that God is the one that replaces and restores everything that evil has taken from us. And evil has a tendency to want to take a bunch more than is fair. I mean, I, I can't tell you how difficult it is to get out of prison one day with $12, have your wife pick you up in a car that a month earlier wouldn't even have made it there to pick me up. Picks me up in this car. We, we drive, we take my $12 and we go right to In-N-Out. <laughs> and uh, from there, I've gone through this incredible metamorphosis here with this family of people who have all been supportive, loving, caring, and I've seen very, very little anger. I've seen love, which is the overwhelming part of, of having a family like this, a family of believers. I, I wish everybody was here today. I, I really do. And, and, and I don't know that Paul realizes how much this family loves and adores him and what a big part of this he is. It's hard for me to stand here in his shoes. I got to be honest with you. Those are big shoes. This man has, has created a, a culture of Jews and Christians, unheard of, unheard of, that worship together. I mean, we're an anomaly, but yet we're going to win because 
God likes small armies. David proved it. They marched into places that they were outnumbered hundredfold and they wiped out the enemy. So I, I think that this little army of ours are a bunch of winners. And, and we have nothing really to uh, be angry about here because we are winning. We are not losing anything. We, we, have, we have really, most of us are at an age where we've fought the battles of life. And I look at my life and I go, wow, how did I get this far? And what did I learn along the way? I'll give you an example. This morning, I was trying to think of what scriptures to talk about. Well, then Larry read Luke 24, starting in verse 17. He's on the road to Emmaus. Emmaus was this little town outside of Jerusalem. Emmaus means truth. So he's on the road to truth. He runs into Cleotus and someone else and on this road and they don't know who he is. He's wearing a cape and he's walking along and they're talking about this horrible situation of this crucifixion and all this and he gets annoyed. Jesus gets mad. He says, you have little heart. How, how, can you, how can you not recognize that this was prophesized? That, that this Messiah was supposed to suffer for all of you? Well, it's getting dark, and sure enough, uh, they're on this road for many hours, and, and they're so intrigued with this man who is reciting Scripture to them like they've never heard before. The walking word. And so... They say, sir, would you please join us for supper? Supper at Emmaus. At Emmaus. So he agrees. He says, okay. And he sits down for the supper and he breaks the bread and he blesses it. And all of a sudden, the hood comes off. The halo shows up. And Cleotus throws his hands up and goes, Oh my God, Lord, it's you. You're alive. Bam. He's gone. He disappears. Well, they immediately run all the way back to Jerusalem to tell the apostles and everybody, they've seen the Lord. Well, in the meantime, the Lord beat him there because he's <laughs> he now has jet propulsion or whatever. He can travel at the speed of light. The Lord has already showed up and showing himself to the apostles. Now, what happened from there? These prophecies, all these prophecies, 350 prophecies of the Bible were fulfilled at that moment. And what happens? The Lord's there. He blesses everybody, and he says, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. We have that Holy Spirit to this day. That Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit that keeps us all going, keeps us all believing, gets us through every single situation that we look at and say it's the end. If we call on the Holy Spirit, it's the beginning. And, and so, so then what happens? Oh my God, the Lord, Yeshua, is lifted magically while his apostles are all standing around him into the sky and disappears just like it's supposed to be. What happens to them though? Now they feel pain. They're angry that the Lord left. They're not organized. They really don't know what to do, but he told them what to do. And the ones that did what he said suffered through life, had the same ups and downs as all of us, but they did their job. And that's what we're missing. We all have a job to do for the Lord. Now, some people it's easy. Some people it's more difficult. But we have a job. You know, Kennedy which was my favorite president as a, as a young man, he became famous for saying one thing. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. That resonated with us. But guess what? 
that parable applies exactly to our lives today. We shouldn't be asking what the Lord can do for us. We should be asking the Lord, what can we do for you, Lord? That's our job. Okay? So, so I'm in prison, and I wake up every morning, and instead of praying, oh God, I hope this goes well, and I need this, and I need that, and please do this, and take care of that, I say, what can I do for you today, Lord? And every day, someone came to me with an assignment, with something, with some need, and I would say, thank you, Lord. That's how I knew God was with me. When you start asking the Lord, what can I do for you today? He'll keep you busy. It's, it's, it's a full-time job. So I've been doing that now since I got out. I've been, every day I keep saying to myself, Lord, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Hoping that he'll say, well, you've done enough. But, but you really never can. You, when, when we really have never done enough until that line goes flat. There's a saying, when the line goes flat, that's that. But it isn't. That's the great part about this life. Larry said to me this morning, you know, we're just a breath. We're just, we're here such a short time. It just, you know, how does this all count? It's because if you truly believe in the Lord and how miraculous he is, then you have to understand that he exhaled us into life. He exhaled to put breath in us. And when we go home, he just inhales us back. It's that simple. It's one breath. Out and then back in. Very simple. And it's painless. The sting of death, Jesus proved, there was no pain. This guy was beaten and stuck with thorns and whipped and everything, tortured beyond torture. Do you think he felt any pain? No. No. The pain that he felt was not physical pain. The pain that he felt was the, our pain, our sins. Everything that we could do wrong, he made right by that sacrifice. So what is that telling you? He showed us the way that we're going to have some pain. We're going to have a little anger. But in the end, in the end, it's beautiful. There is no sting of death. We transform from these physical bodies that is nothing more than this part of this miraculous creation of the Lord into some sort of a butterfly or whatever, whatever it is you can imagine we become spiritually embodied. And we can do what the Lord did. We can fly at the speed of light. We can, we're going to be in a heavenly place. We're going to be with the Lord of all creation, of all time. Now just imagine if one of the great parts of being in prison is you get to read a lot. So, so the, Hugh Ross wrote a book called The Improbable Planet. Has anybody read that? No, only me. Okay. Well, if, if you decided to read The Improbable Planet, because it's so technical, I had to read it three times to understand it. And I have a pretty good comprehension of reading. But what it said is that the creation of God itself proves beyond any reasonable doubt that there's a God. That science has never been able to disprove it. And here's why. In this creation of this universe, of all the stars, all the planets, all the galaxies, everything that's out there, trillions maybe of stars, each one has our name on it. I got my star, you got yours, you definitely have one. And so in all this miraculous creation, we're on this little tiny planet, but this planet is the improbable planet. 
this planet took four and a half billion years to go through the manifestation to be able to not only have life, but support life, and now support billions of people. This planet is miraculous. In four and a half billion years, just imagine how many times meteors had to hit this planet, the crust of it, to put gold, silver, platinum, all these minerals that we have on the earth that all came from outside, from the universe, into this planet that eventually created soil, which could eventually create life. This is the only planet that got that four and a half billion year beating from God to create a place where there could be life. Four and a half billion years. That means Satan took that beating for four and a half billion years. <laughs> that Satan lived here and <laughs> with meteor flying all over the place, hitting this. It, it took four and a half billion years to transform planet Earth into the place we see today. There, it, the impossibility, the odds of this happening anywhere else in the universe, exactly the way it happened, where we have a moon exactly positioned the exact right distance from us, a sun exactly positioned the right distance from us, it, it all adds up perfectly to where this is the only planet where there could be life. So you can forget about E.T. and you can forget about all of the, the ex extraterrestrials because we are them. That's who we are. We're the ones that attack if somebody comes that, that we don't like. We're, we're, we're kind of, we're this being that because we've been empowered by God and because we have all of his DNA, all of his likenesses, we're so much like Yeshua that it's scary. He was a man that walked amongst us and he wasn't known for great looks. He wasn't known for an outgoing personality. He wasn't known. He didn't. He was just a normal man. But he was the living God amongst us. And if God had sent that Messiah, as the Jewish people believed, he would have come with the chariots and all this and armor and everything. And, and the, he would have been this godly Messiah. See, the Jews don't believe Jesus is the Messiah because they don't believe any man can be God. It's just that simple. If you're Jewish and you're raised the way I was, Jesus couldn't have been Messiah because God can't be man. But yet he was a man. And he had anger, he, ha he had pain, but he had love. And what he taught us, what he showed us, and Larry and I talked about this this morning, is that love overcomes everything. It transcends itself beyond the universe. That love in the end prevails. There's nothing that can stand against it. Meaning, God is love. Who can stand against God? So I'm here today to tell you that yes, God does replace everything we've lost. God does give it back tenfold, a hundredfold, whatever it is, if you do one thing. You've got to remain faithful through it. You've got to have that ability to say, I can do anything with God behind me. I can get through anything with God behind me. Because if you don't have the undying faith, then you're part of this world that God is losing. And it's breaking God's heart. So his message, I believe today, the message that I'm supposed to give is that get busy. Start doing your job. Start filling this place with other people that need to know the Lord. So that when we say, is there anybody here that doesn't know the Lord that needs to be saved? We can do a call to the altar. We need to start working 
for the kingdom now, not when we get there. This is our job. This is the place that we're supposed to do it. Today, we have our small family that's always here. We have way more food than you guys can eat, so you can take things home. But we want to build this family. We're a small army, and we're going to win in the end, but wouldn't it be nice to have a lot more people, a much bigger army to fight this battle so that when we go into battle, we know that we got God behind us because he filled this place up. So I want to see this place full. And I hope the next time I come back and I get to speak, I get to speak to a full crowd. Then I'll be nervous. But, but, but the point is, it needs, we need to fill it up, guys. We need to do our job. We need to, we, go, we were working at the street fair for six months. I got indoctrinated into that. It was fun. I was, I was with Larry and John and, and Gary, and we'd sit there at night, and people would come up about and ask us, well, who was the great rabbi? That was the big question. And we'd get into conversing with them. And every now and then, someone would accept the Lord. Someone would come here and accept the Lord. Someone would accept the Lord there. And that's when Clarence's bell is ringing in heaven. See, that's when we're really doing our job. We're not doing our job sitting around here and eating and enjoying our lives. And, and I know that it's hot as Hades out there. I mean, I know God created Palm Springs to let us know what hell is like. So my wife has moved me into hell. And it's a wonderful thought. Hopefully, he'll cool things down eventually. But, the, but truthfully, with my heart, I want you all to know that this job, I see people doing it. I, I know the people who are doing their job. I know the people who are working for the kingdom of God. And all I can say is, if you get with that program, if you get with the Lord, and instead of asking him, do this for me, do that, please take care of this, please take care of that, guess what? Those billions of prayers he gets daily fall on deaf ears. Because if you believe in him, you know he covers every one of your needs. He knows what you need. You don't have to remind him. You don't have to wake up every morning and say, oh, God, I need gasoline or I need food. I need this. No, he knows what we need. So praying for these little things is just a lot of noise out there in heaven. What we need to be doing is the job that he appointed to his son, to the apostles that followed that son. That's our job. That's what we be, need to be doing. We need to be saving people and saving them the right way. Look how many Christians accept the Lord, stand up and say the prayer, walk out, never pick up a Bible, never go back to church again, anything else. And I meet them and they go, well, I was saved. How long ago? 30 years ago. Great. How many times have you been to church? Just that once. I only needed to go once. I said, good, well, I hope I see you up there. Because... Because that's not what it's all about. When you say that prayer and you say, I'm going to live my life for the Lord. Live my life for you, Yeshua. Well, well are you doing it? Or are you just kind of being a lousy husband? I mean, we're the, we're the bride. We're the, we're, the, we're the ones that are married to this Lord and we're the ones that are to be doing the work that he assigned to this first early congregation. And look what Paul did. Paul went off to take care of all the Gentiles. The other apostles didn't want to do it. They only wanted to, to bring Jews to the Lord. Paul was the one responsible for the amalgamation of the Jews and the Gentiles. And what a great thing that was because it was God's plan. So he had to get the people that he knew could do it. That's why he grabbed Paul. He knew that Paul's heart was right. And so 
Let's get our hearts right. Let's get our minds right. Let's go about our lives showing and expressing to other people that you don't have to be mad. You don't have to be angry because what God has prepared and what he has waiting for you is worth whatever you have to go through here to get there. It's the real deal. It's all of it. If you live this breath where you were exhaled before you're inhaled, you need to do something for the Lord. I was taught, when I went to Hebrew school when I was 13, was I 13? No, I was 12. I went to Hebrew school and they taught us, the rabbi, that God put Jews here for one reason. That in our life, if we do one good thing for one person, then we fulfilled what God breathed into us and, and will inhale. In other words, God only expected, according to the Jews, do one great thing for another person, another man. But it doesn't stop there. And that's, that's why it, I feel sorry for so many Jews that have missed the boat, that, that, that aren't sitting here with us and praising Yeshua. Because what we have and what we have the ability to do with whatever time we have left in our life, in our breath, we have a job to do. When you get in front of the Lord, you're not judged anymore for your sins. There's nobody in heaven getting judged for anything they did wrong. When that book of life opens, you're getting judged for what you did for the Lord. You're getting judged for how many jewels are going to be in your crown. How hard did you work for the Lord? How much time and effort did you put out? That's what you're judged for. Not your sins. Because of Yeshua, you're sinless. So, we have this journey that begins when we return. It didn't begin here and it doesn't end here. This is just the transformation of our creation through God's eyes from the soul to the spiritual being. It's, it's one trip. So, I beg you all today to get serious about your walk with the Lord. Don't just come on Saturday and then spend the rest of the week not thinking about it, not opening your Bible, not watching TBN or any... Or just stay in touch with the Lord by saying, what can I do for you today? If you do that one little thing, he'll speak to you. He'll answer you. Your phone will ring. Somebody will need a ride. Somebody will need something that you'll do for them. And that's God working through you to help somebody. Because that's what he does. He works through others to, do, to help us. So I'm going to close today with a little prayer. And... Uh, Everybody repeat after me. Yeshua. I ask you today to come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins, Lord. I want to live my life for you. From this day forward. And I pray this in the mighty name of Yeshua. Amen, amen.